You know, we hear a lot about Jesus, and we hear a lot about Christianity, and everyone is well aware of what the Bible is. And some of you can probably even quote some of your favorite scriptures or passages from the Bible. They're motivational and encouraging, and I would agree with you in that they are. But how many people do you reckon know about the gospel? Well, if you don't know, now you know. So, the gospel. Where do I begin? I believe the first place to start when discussing the gospel is by reviewing its etymology, which is the study of the origin and history of words or a particular word. In other words, what is the origin or the story behind the word the gospel? Well, the word the gospel is derived from the Anglo-Saxon term God's spell, which literally means good story or good news. And what is this good news? Well, I'll get to that in just one moment. Sometimes when people are asked, what is the gospel? They sometimes think about the gospels, which is the first four books of the New Testament. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And although this is not technically correct, it's a good start to gaining a better understanding of what the gospel is. And so I'll give them props for knowing where to find the gospel at least. Now, the first four books of the New Testament are not just any books. They are narratives and are considered to be historical and reliable records of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, this is an important fact to note because there are many people who would try to read through the Gospels as if they were just merely fictional stories that a group of men came up with. There are some people mainly atheists and agnostics who will try to disregard these accounts and say that they are not historical or credible. However, to disregard or to discount the Gospels would in turn discount other events or documents that we count as historical with less corroborating evidence than that recorded in the Gospels. And that's a point not many people want to think about or even admit. But if we're being logically coherent and consistent with what qualifies an event or a document as historical or credible, then we have no other choice but to acknowledge that the Gospels are historical and credible evidences uh, for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, consider what the Apostle John had to say about this subject in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-4. through 4. It says this, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. In this passage, John was writing to his community and he wanted them to know that these accounts and letters that were being passed along by the apostles were not just your average books or letters. They were historical accounts that were based upon that which they have seen and heard and touched with their hands. These documents were written to testify to the ministry and life of Jesus Christ and to proclaim the gospel to those who have ears to hear. And I will do a separate video on explaining the theology behind the gospels themselves. After all, that is one of the best places to start when trying to search and understand what the gospel is. Another good place to start when trying to get a good understanding of what the gospel is, or perhaps the best place to start, is in the first pages of the book of Genesis. You see, before we can discuss what the good news is, we first have to have a good understanding of what the bad news is. And the bad news is found in the narrative of Adam and Eve. You see, in the beginning, God created the light and the darkness, the beautiful sky above and the land, the seas, the plants, and the trees below the sun, the moon, the stars, and every living creature that walks the face of the earth. And at the end of each day, God called what he had created good. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. 
you're right. You're saying to yourself that if God created everything to be good, where is this so-called bad news, right? Uh, well, that comes after he had created the first man and the first woman. You see, God created human beings to be image bearers of himself and to have dominion over the beasts in the field and the birds in the air and the creatures in the sea. God gave man the ultimate task, which was to rule and care for God's good world. But before God can truly entrust them with such a task, he had to put them to the test to see if they would put their trust in him and not in themselves for guidance. The test was this, Adam and Eve could eat from any fruit from any tree within the Garden of Eden, all with the exception of one fruit from one specific tree. And that tree was the knowledge of good and evil. God warned them that if they ate from that specific tree, they would surely die. And Adam and Eve understood these instructions, and they heeded to God's warning up until that old serpent entered the scene. The serpent started to plant seeds of doubt into the mind of Eve, causing her to second-guess the clear instructions of God himself. Uh, this prompted her to do the unthinkable. She ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and as she ate from the tru uh, free fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she gave some to her husband. Adam so that he too could eat from it and both of their eyes were open right and here is where the bad news comes to play you see Adam and Eve had sinned they disobeyed God's commandments and by doing so death entered the world God had promised that if they ate of that fruit they would surely die and sure enough they both ate from it right they ate of the forbidden fruit being that Adam was the head of his household, and being that Eve derived from him, and being that it was he who received God's instructions to not eat of the fruit, he was ultimately the one who got turned to first to receive an explanation as to why and how did this happen. You see, Adam did not just represent himself. He represented all of humanity. Because of this transgression, all of humanity will now be born into sin. The Apostle Paul speaks to the human condition in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, which says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. You see, it says all have sinned. That is the human condition. We are all slaves to sin, Romans 6 and 20. We are addicted to our fleshly desires, Ephesians 2 and 3. The scriptures say that we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, Ephesians 2 and 1. And I want to pause there to reiterate that point. It says dead, not drowning, not waiting for a lifeboat to pull us out. We are not on a ventilator fighting for our life. We are not neutral to God. In fact, the scriptures explicitly mention how we were hostile to God and his word. Romans 8 and 7. We are enemies of him. Romans 5 and 10. And just like our ancestor, we are destined for death. We are owed it as it is the consequence, or as Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of our sin. That is the bad news. It is that through Adam, all of humanity has been plunged into darkness and now dead in their sin. And there is nothing that we can do to revive ourselves. None of our good deeds, such as our charitable giving, our occasional obedience to the law of God, and our occasional love for others can warrant us salvation from the impending wages of sin. To put our righteousness into perspective, the prophet Isaiah has this to say about our supposed righteousness in Isaiah 64 verses 6 through 7. He says this, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our unrighteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is none who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. So as you see, the righteous deeds of a rebellious and sinful man means nothing to a holy and righteous God. It is like a murderer standing before a just judge in his trial and saying to the judge, Hey, I believe that you should acquit me of all my bloody murders because I give lots of money to the poor. And we see how foolish that looks because we understand that there is no amount of money that you can give to the poor that will overshadow your bloody murders. You took someone's life and they will never be able to get that back. And so your money is tainted, filthy, polluted. This is the same with us 
and God, right? The problem that we have is that we do not view ourselves and our sins as bad as that of the murder, right? We still believe that we are good enough to go to a holy and righteous judge and say, hey, I gave lots of money to the poor. Can I be acquitted for my sins, right? I did these good deeds. Am I off the hook? And I believe that is uh, because we do not fully grasp and understand the weight and depravity of our sin and our sinful nature. Every time we lie, cheat, steal, covet, envy, it is considered to be cosmic treason against God Almighty. Think about it, right? What did Adam do that plunged all of humanity into his fallen nature, right? He simply ate of the fruit that God told him not to, right? Simply put, he was disobedient, right? There are many of you who are guilty of the same sin as Adam. God told you not to lie, and you lied. He said, do not steal, and you stole. He said, love your enemies, and you hate them. And so just like our ancestor Adam, you too are plunged into, you plunge humanity into a darker state than it was before. The other things to note when discussing the level of seriousness behind our sin is for whom it is being committed. For an example, to lie to one's parent is one thing, but to lie in court is a whole other thing, right? One will get you in timeout, and the other will get you sent to jail. It's the same uh, sin, but punished to a different degree, right? So if lying will get you in timeout with your parents and in jail when you're in court, how much worse would our punishment be if it is before a holy and internal and righteous God? Yeah, that is the bad news. But God, being so gracious and so merciful, did not leave us with only the bad news. In the very same moment that Adam plunged all of humanity into darkness, he gave a promise in Genesis 3, chapter 14 and 15, when he pronounced his curse to the serpent who deceived Eve. And it says this, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You see, God promised that in the offspring of Eve, he would bring about that promised seed who would crush that old serpent once and for all. And throughout the Old Testament, God would later clarify just what exactly that promised seed, the Messiah, would do for all of humanity. And I can think of no better passage that we get a more clarifying picture of this Messiah, the Savior of the world, than in Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6, it says this, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of his all. This suffering servant, prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, was said to be crushed for our iniquities in verse 5. This is that promised seed spoken of by God back in Genesis chapter 3. The promised seed is the Messiah, and he comes to be the propitiation for the sins of those who put their faith in him. It is only by his piercings, his crushed body, his chastisement, and his wounds that we will find penance for our transgression, pardons for our iniquities, peace for our souls, and healing for our body. This is is the good news. The good news is that God did not leave humanity to rot in our own sin, but instead he promised that in this Messiah, we would find salvation. And his sacrifice will not just be a sacrifice that brings about potential for salvation, but rather an actual one. This is where the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John come into play. These accounts record Jesus' life in great detail, and they record how he fulfilled all of the prophecies about that promised seed. It records how he was born of the Virgin Mary, and therefore not a recipient of the curse of Adam. 
right? It records how he lived a perfect life, following all of God's laws so as to become the perfect sacrifice for all who would believe in him. It records how he died and how he was buried and was resurrected on the third day, taking on all of the iniquities of those who would believe in him. This is the gospel, right? This is the good news for those who would believe. Christ lived, died, and rose again so that we too, we could too. Your good deeds cannot save you, all right? They never could. For those who believe that they will buy their way into heaven or that they will just do more good than bad so as to give them a chance to enter into the kingdom of God, let me be the first to tell you that you will still stand condemned under God's law. James makes it very clear. When you are in violation of one of God's laws, then you are guilty of all of it, right? It's all or nothing. And there is only one man who has walked the face of the earth and obeyed all of God's law perfectly. And that man is God incarnate, Jesus Christ. Look, the message that all I have is this. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. Do it now while you still have time. The bad news is that you're dead in your sins and you can't save yourself. But the good news is this, that you don't have to, right? The promise the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself, lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, and rose from the grave so that you could too, if you repent and believe. That, my friends, is the gospel. That, my friends, is the good news.